What a quiet group we are this morning, isn't that? Sort of lovely. <laughs> Good morning, friends. Welcome. Great to see you all here today. I trust you're not all counting down the days because one of the recurring themes on social media at the moment is all the people in Canberra saying, please can't we switch our heating on before Anzac Day? I felt like putting a response on saying, you know, man, uh, man was made for the Sabbath, not the Sabbath for man and etc. but I didn't. As we meet this morning, we meet on the land of the Ngunnawal and Narrabri people and pay respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Being Holy Week, it's a busy week and there's plenty in the notice sheet. So John, would you like to bring us the notices? Welcome to the notices. We'll be uh, at morning tea. We'll be welcoming back um, Ender and Richard Curtis, who've been returned from a sojourn in the warmth of Tweed Heads to brave the cold in Canberra again. Um, we encourage you all to continue to wear your mask in church if you are medically able to wear a mask. As with winter coming on, the mask will help protect you and others against other respiratory infections as well as COVID. And don't forget your flu shots and COVID shots, COVID booster shots. You can see the Easter services in the pew sheet. Um, don't forget to bring some hot cross buns for the Good Friday service with Holy Cross at 9am on Good Friday. And then on Easter Sunday at 10.30, Don Erickson is preaching and leading us in communion. This afternoon, the Palm Sunday Rally for Justice for Refugees is at 1 p.m. in Grima Place. The fact that the Anglican Bishop, Carol Wagner, is speaking at the rally is a reminder that the churches have been working on this issue in partnership with secular organisations for decades and the work of the churches has been very important in progress that has been achieved on this issue. We are very thankful that most of the people in detention centres have been released, but of course these people are still on restrictive temporary visas with an uncertain future, so more work still needs to be done. Um, and there is um, in your notice sheet um, an appeal for um, the Ukraine crisis to which you can donate. And I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you, John. The Uniting Church presence at the Palm Sunday rally, we are meeting at the carousel at one o'clock. So any or all of you who would like to come would be more than, than welcome. I know that there are people from City Church and there'll be people from those, those groups south of the lake as well. Please join with me in our call to worship. We come to prepare for the holiest of weeks. We will journey through praise with joy on our lips. We will travel through betrayal and death cradling hope deep in our hearts. Jesus leads us through this week and we will follow for he is the life we long for. He is the word who sustains us. We wave palm branches in anticipation. We lay our love before him to cushion his walk. Setting aside all power, glory and might he comes modeling humility and obedience for all of us. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who brings in the kingdom of God. Amen. 
We have three readings this morning and they're interspersed through the service and Kerry is going to bring us our first. The first reading is from Luke 19, verses 28 to 40. After he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he came near Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you'll find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who are sending, who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the ground. As he was now approaching the path down to, from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Thank you, Kerry. Our first hymn is one of great joy, wonderful tune, great words. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. I'm sure you all know it well. So let's stand early as Robin wants us to and sing loud. Let's move into a time of prayer, of giving thanks for what we have and saying sorry for what we don't do. Let's pray. On this Sunday, O oh God, we remember how blessed we are. We have food, we have friends, we have family, 
We have groups to fellowship with. We have the morning chorus of the magpies and the pungent eucalypt smells around us. On this Sunday, O oh God, help us to remember our blessings large and small. Help us to be thankful. But on this Sunday, O oh God, we also remember how quickly we change, how fickle we can be, how we pledge our devotion one minute and turn our backs the next. We can go from shouting, Hosanna, save us, to crucify him in an instant. We declare that we love our neighbours and then we turn our back on the homeless and the hungry in our communities. We speak up for change and justice in one breath and then continue unjust practices in, in our daily lives by what we consume and the needs we ignore. Forgive us, O oh God, when we are half-hearted believers. Forgive us, O oh God, when we are partial justice warriors. Forgive us, O oh God, for when we tire easily and we forget and we grow weary. Forgive us, restore us, and renew us for the journey of faith so that we might become whole people who live wholly into your vision of a new life. In the name of the Christ, who lived into the fullness of humanity and whom we follow. Amen. And friends, it's that presence, that God who forgives us, who restores us and renews us that we meet to worship this morning. The peace of that God be with you all. Let's share the peace. So our Echo Minute, 30 months is not a very long time. Does anyone remember what the significance of 30 months is this week? It was the time the IPCC report gave us to change the trajectory of our carbon emissions. They said if we haven't made major change by 2025, we will have great difficulty in having any chance of keeping the planet's warming below two degrees. Overshooting 1.5 degrees is now seen as almost inevitable, but it will be possible to wind it back, providing we act now. Professor Jim Ski, a co-chair of the report said, it's now or never. Without immediate and deep emission reductions across all sectors, it will be impossible. 
The implication for fossil fuels is clear. It's over. We must reduce our dependence on fossil fuels enormously. And given the finance pages, headlines of what a wonderful boon the war in Ukraine was going to be for LPG sales, etc. I'm not, I'm not optimistic, but I hope I'm hopeful. Antonio Guterres, the United Nations Secretary General said, too many, too many government and business leaders are saying one thing, but doing another. Put simply, they are lying. Increasing fossil fuel production will only make matters worse. It's time to stop burning our planet and start investing in the abundant renewable energy around us. These are government decisions. But for the majority of the Western world, governments are elected by voters. And that's us. I'll leave it there. Another Palm Sunday song, which you will know, although these words have been slightly changed to more reflect the humility of Jesus's kingship rather than the martial part of it. Ride on, ride on in majesty. The palms affirm with certainty your claim to be Messiah King. The crowds join in and loudly sing. Let's sing loudly. The second reading is called The Unking. We call you King Jesus, but you are not like any king we've ever heard of. You don't flaunt your power, waving your hand dismissively to change the lives of your subjects. You don't hoard your wealth and tax your people just to grow more comfortable in your isolated palace. You don't exploit the weak and unconnected or use the ambition of ladder climbers to further your control. No, you are the king who lays down his crown to walk among us as one of us. You are the king who lays down his life to bring abundant eternal life to all who seek it. You are the king who draws the weak, the rejected, the poor, the child, into the centre of the conversation and into the heart of where real power lies. You, Jesus, are the unking, 
the king whose kingdom redefines everything we know and will continue to do so for eternity. Amen. The last line of the first reading that Robin, that Robin, sorry, that Kerry <laughs> brought us said, Jesus replied to the Pharisees, if they don't call out the very stones will sing. And this next hymn is picking up on that. Here we wave our palms in honour. Here we lay our garments down. We shout psalms of adoration, crying, blessed is the king. And you say that if we are silent, then the very stones would sing. Let's sing. And the third reading today is entitled, Jesus Takes on the City. It was on the Sunday that he took on the city. Religious freaks usually appear in the desert, urging folk to come into the open air and find God through getting back to nature. God, they seem to say, doesn't live in the city. God, they seem to say, prefers the smell of a garden to that of a gutter. God, they say, they seem to say, prefers the gurgling streams 
not trickles of urine from the bladder of a homeless person. They saw the city as a place of sin. God doesn't go there. It was on, a sun, on the Sunday that he took on the city. Meekness and majesty, manhood and deity in perfect harmony. The eternal one dwells in humanity, kneels in humility and washes our feet. Oh, what a mystery, meekness and majesty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before you get shocked at the title of my reflection this morning, I don't think I'm about to be heretical, but please let me know if you think I am. This week's reflection is one of those that I need to acknowledge a source because it was one of those that I knew the thrust of what I wanted to talk about and I found an article that summed it up and wrote it far better than I could with some editing. So I need to say that a substantial part of this reflection is taken from a writer by the name of Jonathan Merritt, who, is, who was in the Southern Baptist tradition in the US and writes for a number of major papers in New York and Washington, etc. cetera. Um, and this is a, a bit of an extract, an edited extract taken from his book, Learning to Speak God from Scratch. In 2016, the New York Magazine published an article on the science of disappointment. The article opened by stating the obvious, which is, that the feeling of being let down is actually one of life's toughest emotional experiences. Of course, most of us don't need a magazine article to know that. Disappointment hurts. Disappointment is an unavoidable part of being human, but as the article noted, the experience is physiological as well as, as being emotional because the feeling of disappointment is linked to your levels of dopamine, the brain's pleasure chemical, released during positive life experiences. But like all these things, there's a catch. The dopamine systems in your brain don't just react to what you experience, they attempt to predict what you will want or need. And there's the catch. Because here's how it works. Your brain generates expectations about the future. Often these ex expectations are based on what you want. Something you, perceived, you perceive as good has happened in the past, so you expect it to happen again in the future. And before it even happens, your dopamine levels start to rise in anticipation that this good thing is going to happen to you. Then, when that good thing actually occurs, you get a double shot of dopamine. Fantastic. Sounds great. Except, as I said to hundreds and hundreds of students when I was a teacher, life isn't fair and don't expect it to be. Life doesn't always give us what we expect. People fail us. People hurt us. Events don't go the way we want them to go. And even, sorry, and when you don't get the desired results, and the experts have coined a wonderful little phrase, a reward prediction error for that crash. Not only do your dopamine levels fall, they plummet from the heightened levels generated by the fact that you were anticipating something good. 
So now instead of receiving a double shot of dopamine, you've got none. You crash doubly hard. Not only do you not get what you wanted, but you also feel the displeasure at having been wrong. The point, losing hurts even worse when it's not what you were expecting. Today's gospel story can be read as a portrait of what it looks like when an, when an entire community suffers a reward prediction error. It's known as the triumphal entry and in common with most uh, church traditions, we celebrate it on Palm Sunday. The story tells us that Jesus turned his face towards a city that kills prophets, stones truth tellers and executes troublemakers. And rather than slip into the city unannounced, Jesus does something strange. He told a couple of his disciples to go to a particular place and retrieve a donkey for him to ride into the city. And when the Jerusalemites saw Jesus approaching, they erupt into excitement. They strip off their cloaks and spread them across the road, pull branches off trees and lay them across Jesus's path. And if this wasn't enough, they broke into the Passover song. All four gospels put this event in their narrative of the passion and the crucifixion. And of course, each of them has their own twist. Matthew, in fact, says the city has been ushered into turmoil. And the word he uses for turmoil is the word we get seismic from, as in with earthquakes. Almost as if Matthew is saying, the whole city is quivering with this anticipation. The story begins with great expectations. Jesus has been in Bethany and has raised Lazarus from the dead. With most of the other of Jesus's raisings, they were pretty instant. Jairus's child had just died and rose and, and lived again, etc. Lazarus has been dead for a few days. In fact, if you remember, I think it might have been Martha who said, but Jesus, don't, don't open the tomb, he'll be stinking. So the crowd in Jerusalem have heard this story and they react. When they see Jesus coming in, their brains bathe in dopamine and they begin to predict how God will act in their lives based on the way that God has acted before. He will intervene again. He'll work a miracle. He'll expel the occupiers and resurrect God's people from the city. Because the palm branches would have been significant to all the crowd. An echo of Judas Maccabeus 200 years earlier, who as he approached, the people waved palm branches and sang hymns. Maccabeus arrived, defeated the Syrian king, recaptured the temple and ruled for more than 100 years before the Romans decided that they'd had enough and came back. The crowd begin to sing Hosanna to the son of David, taken from Psalm 118 that was sung at the beginning of Passover. The word Hosanna means Lord save us now. They are asking Jesus to drive out the enemy army and restore order. And even the donkey plays a role in elevating expectations with its echoes of the prophet Zechariah. One can imagine that night over dinner tables across Jerusalem, discussing the day in hushed voices. Could this be the one? Could this be the king? He was riding a donkey after all. Their dopamine systems would have been in overdrive because it's all about the expectations. 
And the crowds that day aren't really much different from us. People haven't really changed much because we tend to assume that God is in the shape that we want. Because for most of us, steeped in church tradition from a young age, we tend to snatch up a couple of verses that seem to support our, prefer our preferred version of what God might look like and how God might act. Then you spend a few years listening to a minister reinforce them through selective storytelling and verse choosing. And before you know it, the cement of these assumptions has dried and you begin expecting God to work in particular ways in your life, not unlike the people of Jerusalem. And that's okay, as long as God seems to do what we want. But the moment God doesn't perform the way we want God to do, our whole world rattles. A baby is born with a disability. A relationship breaks down. A friend dies far too early. And the expectations you placed on God ferment into distrust, then into disappointment. The author Anne Lamott has a wonderful phrase. She says, expectations are resentments under construction, which I think is a delightful phrase. Expectations are resentments under construction. And how do we respond when it seems like our world's crashing around us? Well, in the 21st century, what do we do? We go to Google. The most Googled questions about God over recent years include the following. Why does God allow suffering? Why does God need so much praise? Why does God hate me? Why did God make me ugly? Why did God make me gay? Why did God make me black? We can see the thread hanging all those questions together. God, why have you disappointed me? Why aren't you doing what I want you to do? Many of us have a common experience when it comes to our spirituality. We expect God to be something and then find that God isn't like that at all. Or we expect God to do something only to realise that God, for some unknown reason, might have other priorities. And in those moments, a tsunami of disappointment comes crashing down on us. The Palm Sunday story dis displays the transition from expectation to disappointment in Technicolor. I know I'm not spoiling the story by telling you that the triumph becomes a trial and the trial becomes an execution. Jesus enters the city on a donkey. He'll leave in a body bag. This isn't just a fun parade. Jesus is walking down death row. And here we have a picture of what happens to a group of very religious people when they feel disappointed by God. They embrace Jesus with their dopamine levels soaring and shouts of save us now. And as soon as Jesus turns into something other than the saviour they expect, their hosannas morph into crucify him. Jesus is a king, but not the kind they wanted. He is the unking. He will serve rather than be served. He will die and not be killed. He enters unarmed, waging peace. This makes the larger point that God does not intend to meet our expectations. Instead, God meets our needs. And it's this type of God 
that makes us uncomfortable because we don't want vegetables when we're hungering for a cream cake. We want a God that satisfies our desires, whether or not those align with our needs. We welcome God into our lives with anticipation, laying down cloaks and waving palm branches. But when God turns out to be someone we don't recognise, we scatter like smoke in the wind. One of the interesting features of this story is how much preparation Jesus does. He lines up everything, making sure to trigger the crowd's expectations. I spoke last year on Palm Sunday about the likelihood that Jesus' entry was deliberately mirroring and poking fun at Pilate's pre-Passover entry to the, to the city in a display of imperial power from Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan's book, The, the Last Week. Oh, excuse me. It's like Jesus has, has hired a PR agency indicating that he knows exactly what he's stirring up. But why? Is he trying to disappoint them? No, I think he's trying to disillusion them. The word disillusion has taken very negative connotations in, in recent years, but it's really very, very simple. Disillusionment is the loss of an illusion. It's seeing things clearly. It's a gift that God gives us with abundance if we're willing to look. It's what happens when you take the lie about the world, about yourself, about those you love, about God, and replace it with the truth. Disillusionment occurs when God shatters our fantasies, tears down our idols, and dismantles our cardboard cutouts. It occurs when we discover that God does not conform to our expectations, but rather exists in a mystery well beyond those expectations. Barbara Brown Taylor in her book, God in Pain, describes disillusionment as the sacred experiences that cut us down to size and remind us of our smallness in this expansive universe. These experiences are often painful, but never bad because they make us shed the lies that we've mistaken for truth. Brown writes, disillusioned, we find out what is not true and then we are set free to seek what is true, if we dare. We are set free to turn away from the God who was supposed to be in order to seek the God who is. I think that's a really profound statement. Set free to turn away from the God who was supposed to be in order to seek the God who is. Because ultimately the triumphal entry is not about donkeys and palm branches at all. It's a reminder to us that placing expectations on God based on what we want is a recipe for resentment. But nurturing an openness to the divine mystery, that's a framework for faith. Moving forward in that faith involves becoming disillusioned with Jesus, sweeping away the lies and the fantasies transforming our disappointments through that painful but wonderful gift of clear sight. It's taking up that invitation to give up holding tight to what we hope would be true. The invitation to stop trying to cast God in our image, but to let God be who God is, not who we wish God would be.
as we move through Holy Week, let's remember Jesus wasn't killed because he preached love. Jesus was killed in the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer because your yes to God requires your no to all injustice, to all evil, to all lies, to all oppression and violence of the weak and the poor. Jesus was killed because practicing love always leads to conflict with the established order. We need to be truly disillusioned with Jesus if we're going to follow faithfully because there are hard, clear-sighted choices to be made. Hosanna, save us now. Amen. Happy to have questions, comments, if people would like. David. Can you use a moment to uh, reflect on something very peripheral to, to what you've been talking about? But it does occur. <clears throat> the the story of the entry into Jerusalem begins with a little episode which doesn't get much publicity. The, 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 the main miracles, well, I use the word main because they're the ones that get publicity. The healing of the sick, the resuscitation of the dead, walking on water. Um, all these miracles are so well known and told so often. There's one little one I've never heard uh, addressed but to me, it's, it's uh, an amazing mystery. Scripture said that Jesus would come in to Jerusalem on a donkey or an ass. I don't recall exactly what it said. So he had to get one. So he said to the disciples, go into the town and untether the colt you'll find there and bring him here. Now, if the leader of my gang had said that to me, my reaction probably would have been no way I'm the one who'll be who'll be lynched as a as a stock rustler, not you. But apparently the disciples did this without question. And it fell into place as Jesus said. Somebody challenged them. And the answer given was, to my mind, not terribly helpful. The, the Lord needs him. I would love to know what went through the mind of that person. That's one of the great mysteries to me. That's a beautiful story. Um, and I'm going to leave it because I can't, I can't wrap it up uh, because I just posed the, the question. I don't understand it. But somehow, this person who, who is not identified queried quite reasonably what appeared to be the theft of the donkey, except that an explanation, which to my mind didn't make much sense unless you were part of the disciples group, and it all worked. To me, that's one of the most profound mysteries of, the, of, of Christ's majesty. Thank you. Thanks. Ooh. Well, yeah, Robin said, on the cross, Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Was Jesus at that point disillusioned with God? Perhaps in the sense of seeing clearly, of finally realising what it really meant, perhaps that is true, yeah, yeah. I just don't know. Perhaps he was all of a sudden... Yeah, that humanity divine mixture that we can never understand. Um, perhaps the human part of him at that stage was finally saying, I really didn't think it was going to be like this. Hmm. 
Yeah, the song in Jesus Christ Superstar, where Jesus is in the garden saying, why me, why me? Why do I have to do this? Yeah, thank you, Robin. Don. Jesus wept over Jerusalem, absolutely. Mm. Mm. Thank you, friends. I'd invite you to share with me in a bit of an affirmation of faith that comes out of what, what, what we were talking about this morning. We affirm that when God dies, it is time to suspect, to suspect that darkness can be crushed by sunrise, that silence can break with song that alleluias can be shouted in graveyards, that love chooses to live. We affirm that when God dies, it is time to suspect that this is not the end. We affirm that when God dies, it is a time to believe, to believe laughter will be heard at dawn, that tombs will be unsealed, that grave clothes will be folded away, that love chooses to live. We affirm that when God dies, it is time to believe this is not the end. We affirm that when God dies, it is a time to trust, to trust that the conspiracy belongs to heaven, that crosses aren't the last word, that the last word is always love and that love chooses to live. We affirm that when God dies, it is time to trust that this is not the end. I'd just like to leave you with a, a meditative song based on the book that I referred to earlier, The Last Week by Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossland. And it's a song about two processions entering Jerusalem. Processions entering Jerusalem Two opposing kingdoms on display Which of these processions are we part of? Which one will we follow on its way? the violent mighty ruler will we trust the peaceful peasant king two processions entering Jerusalem power of love against the love of power will we choose the path of domination Will we let compassion have its hour God has had a dream of joyful justice Rome has spun a nightmare of neglect If we join the commonwealth of service joy and justice yet to procession
processions entering Jerusalem. Realm of all dominion built on fear. As we choose the path that love has opened, we will see the realm of hope draw near. As we come to pray for others, we do it as part of the task we have been given in Philippians 2 of bringing about our own salvation, for God is at work in us, providing the will and the energy to do what pleases God. Our prayers are about aligning our everyday efforts with God's purposes for the world, and together we can change the world a little bit for the better. In our prayers today, we are praying for Bulgaria, hung Hungary and R Romania. Hungary and Romania are hosting many Ukrainian refugees at present. In the Presbytery, we are praying for the Grace Faith Community in Goulburn, which is an innovative way of doing church, which particularly is appealing to young people. Um, and in our community today, we are particularly um, thinking of um, Sonia, Joel, Adam and family, um, Anthony, Swaddling and family, and uh, Joel's um, um, housemate, Melissa, who, who is facing re-employment, and others. We, we remember in our hearts. Let us pray. We pray for peace in the world. Our world is torn apart in so many places. Grant us your peace. We pray for our politics, that we may choose wisely and with compassion in the forthcoming election. And the campaign will focus on policies that will make a difference in our lives rather than character assassination. We pray for our communities of Holy Cross and St. Margaret's for the great work they do in Tucker Box, Meg's, Toy Box and Ross Walker Lodge, and for the community of care they provide to so many people. Guide us, Lord God, that we may be wise in our compassion. We pray for healing for those we know who are injured in heart, mind, body and soul. We don't ask for instant healing, Lord, but we do want, we do ask for and we want little bits of healing day by day that we may live a more effective and more joyful life. Let us pray for healing silently for those who are on our hearts at this point in time. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our last hymn is one from one of the most prolific hymn writers in the US and probably around the Christian church. 
Carol and Gillette. We long to know peace, Jerusalem said, as Caesar's great troops filled people with dread. As soldiers and armies marched in with great might, no justice was found, no peace was in sight. Let's sing. Please remain standing and join with me in a responsive blessing, which is also a statement of commitment. Here in this sanctuary, we have remembered, O oh God, your gift of life to each of us. Now we seek to carry it to the streets, wherever there is death and violence, wherever there is grief and loss. Here in this sanctuary, we have remembered, O oh God, your invitation to belong and find shelter. Now we seek to carry it to the streets, wherever there is loneliness and rejection, wherever there is homelessness and people are displaced. Here in this sanctuary, we have remembered, O oh God, your reign of justice and righteousness, now we seek to carry it to the streets, wherever there is lawlessness or tyranny, wherever there is corruption or oppression. Here in this sanctuary, we have remembered, O oh God, your sacrifice of love and mercy. Now we seek to carry it to the streets, wherever there is hatred and evil, wherever there is hopelessness, regret or guilt. Here in this sanctuary, where we have remembered all you have done for us, O oh God, we remember also your call to live what we sing and pray. So now we commit ourselves again to carry our worship from the sanctuary to your streets to serve those you love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. 